Hands Off My Podcast is a proud member of DarkCast Network, where the light shines brightest on our indie podcasts. Hola, my beautiful humans. This is Jasmine Castillo. And this is MW. Bringing awareness of murdered and missing indigenous women, girls, two spirits, the LGBTQ community, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, Black Indigenous people of color. These are their stories. So, welcome to Hands Off, my podcast. It's been three years since 34-year-old Matthew J. Broncho of Ford Hall mysteriously disappeared, and his grieving family members are desperate for word from anyone who may have seen or had contact with him. Broncho disappeared in Fort Hall, Idaho. On March 20th, 2019, he has never been heard from again. He disappeared with his dog, a red Dutch hound named Afa. This is Matthew's story. Matthew's story hits on a huge, sensitive subject and something that hasn't been spoken of or about. Matthew and his family are from the Shoshone Bannock tribe, and this is a case about missing and murdered indigenous men and boys. Here's a little bit of history in regards to the Shoshone Bannock tribe. From the Shoshone Bannock tribe website, the Shoshone Bannock tribe of Fort Worth are composed of the eastern and western bands of the northern Shoshone and the Bannock, or northern Paiute bands. Ancestral lands of both tribes occupied vast regions of land encompassing present-day Idaho, Oregon, Nevada, Utah, Wyoming, Montana, and Canada. Today, the indigenous community has over 5,900 tribal members. The tribes are culturally related and though both descend from Numeka family of the Uta Aztecan linguistic class, are dialectically separate. When the northern Paiutes left the Nevada and Utah regions for southern Idaho in the 1600s, they began to travel with the Shoshones in pursuit of buffalo. They became known as the Bannocks. In previous episodes, I have stressed that there has been many treaties created and broken, and what it should have been respected word for word. Here is a piece of the treaty. This signed Fort Bridger was on July 3rd of 1868. That was between the United States and the Shoshone Bannock tribe. From this day forward, peace between the parties to this treaty shall forever continue. The government of the United States desires peace, and it honors its hereby pledge to keep it. The Indians desire peace, and they hereby pledge their honor to maintain it. If bad men among the whites, or among other people subject to the authority of the United States, shall commit any wrong upon the person or property of the Indians, the United States will, upon proof made to the agent and forwarded to the Commissioner of Indian Affairs at Washington City, Proceed at once to cause the offender to be arrested and punished according to the laws of the United States, and also reimburse the injured person for the loss sustained. This 154-year-old treaty displays Shoshone and Bannock from their land as that Shoshone and Bannock tribal members should be allowed to hunt, fish, and gather inside Yellowstone National Park, which is now considered southern Wyoming. This treaty granted the Shoshone and Bannock native people the right to hunt on the unoccupied lands of the United States. Yet, today, with a few exceptions, hunting isn't allowed by tribal members or anyone else in Yellowstone. The federal government never upheld its end of this deal. Cynthia Metz, his mother, describes Matthew as a quiet and thoughtful person, a very intelligent young man who was planning on returning to college 
to work on his master's degree. Matt attended Idaho State University, receiving a Bachelor of Science degree in 2008. At the age of 34, majored in political science with an emphasis in environmental and federal Indian law economics. During college, Matt interned for the Shoshone Bannock Agricultural Resource Management Program, where he was pr promoted to manager soon after graduation. He helped the tribe with various agricultural and environmental programs throughout his career and served on the Shoshone Bannock School Board. Matt had moved back into his mom's home on the Fort Hall Reservation in Idaho in 2018, following a breakup with his girlfriend. On March 19, 2019, Matt told her that he planned to resign from his job at the tribe's commodity program, a position he wasn't satisfied with. They talked about his future education plans. Then he told Cynthia that he was going into town for some errands. He picked up his dog, a Dutch hound, named Afa, and walked out the door. Matthew's father, Jim Broncho, believes he may have dis believes he may have been depressed because of a series of personal problems, and no one in the family has any idea that he had in mind when he left, or even that he planned to leave. To Cynthia, this was so unlike Matt to just up and leave without telling anybody. She even mentioned that he had his truck serviced and had a new battery put in just recently. Cynthia and Jimmy are not the only Shoshone Bannock tribal members coping with the loss of a lost loved one. Jimmy estimates there are around five or six unsolved cases of missing and murdered people in the Fort Hall Reservation alone, with the most recent one being a woman found dead of undetermined causes last spring of 2021. One of the people that I had found that had at least some information on them missing or murdered indigenous persons, one of the longest missing persons is Webster George of Blackfoot. He was reported missing September 1st of 1982, and his body still hasn't been found. Yet he was declared deceased in 2018. Lionel Hudi Pokibro died on January 11, 2016. His family said his death was determined to be a homicide, but there has been no arrests or convictions in tribal or federal court, and the U.S. Attorney's Office has done nothing on the case. Austin Forrest Bevel. He was a firefighter and a competitive Native American dancer. Bevel's mother recalls dropping him off at a home in Fort Hall where he had been hired to cut firewood on February 3, 2018. Within hours, he was murdered. Yet just recently in 2021, three persons had been connected to his murder and had been charged with the crime. If you want to learn more information about these persons that are missing and murdered indigenous from the Fort Hall Reservation location, I will have the link in the show notes. And even though I had named off a few, there is probably more, much more. As I mentioned before, Matthew was working at the Shoshone Bannock Tribe's Commodities Department, but he was terminated on March 18th, which was two days before he disappeared. Yet on March 20th, he informed his mother that he planned on turning in his resignation from the Commodities Program. She last seen him at the home of 172 North Rio Vista Road. He was wearing a gray Nike pullover, blue jeans, and black Under Armour running shoes, a black Raiders baseball cap, and a gold-rimmed Ray-Ban aviator sunglasses. He drove off with his faithful companion dog, a three-year-old red Dutch hound named Afa. On the same day, he made a bake transaction, withdrawing $250. There were receipts in a vehicle to show he expended the amount withdrawn on that day. The transactions he made that day gave no indication that he had planned on leaving home for an extended length of time. On March 22nd, with no word from Matthew, Cynthia called Matt's dad, Jimmy, and asked if he had seen Matt. He hadn't. Jimmy, in a state of panic, started calling Utah hospitals and police departments. His mother became extremely concerned and was able to locate his cell phone via GPS. She was able to locate the 2011 Toyota Tacoma pickup, a 
about 8 p.m. that day. It had been parked on Interstate 84, Exit 7 off-ramp, at Snowville, Utah. This is 95 miles south of Fort Hall. It's about a two-hour drive. When she arrived, the doors were closed and locked. Matt's phone and wallet were in the truck center console containing his driver's license, tribal ID, and bank cards. It looks like as if he had eaten a pizza for lunch, based on the pizza box and a Monster Energy drinks in the truck. The truck was taken to the nearest gas station, fueled up, and drove back to Fort Hall. Worried about where her son could be, Cynthia drove the truck, for she had spare key, around town to see if anyone had any, any information on Matthew's whereabouts. That evening, his mother asked the attendants at the two gas stations, two cafes, and a hotel if they had seen him. No one recognized him from her photos. No recall seeing him or his dog. When she inquired about a local law enforcement office, she was informed by a gas station attendant the nearest police department is in Brigham City, Utah, 50 miles away and it takes the sheriff an hour to respond. During her search to locate Matt that evening, she did contact the Box Elder County Sheriff's Office. The dispatcher informed her that she would pass on the information to the deputy on duty as they were out of another report of a missing Brigham City woman. A former employee of Shoshone Bannock High School reported seeing Matthew at Lava Hot Springs the evening of March 20th. Also on March 21st, a woman gave a vague description of Matt, indicating she saw him walking his dog near the exit 7 ramp at 4 p.m., where the truck was located. When she arrived home in Fort Hall the next morning and Matt still wasn't there on March 23rd, his mother filled a missing persons report with the Fort Hall Police Department. The Fort Hall Police Department informed they would contact Box Elder County Sheriff's Office in Brigham City, Utah. Family and friends began their own search on March 24th, returning to Snowville, Utah. Cynthia, along with Jimmy and, and other family members, began searching Snowville for any signs of Matt. They walked through sagebrush, through mountains. It was a tough, cold, snowy, rainy day. On the evening of March 27th, Cynthia was contacted by an employee at the ranch house diner. She was informed that an individual found Matthew's dog on Exit 5, two miles west of Exit 7 in Snowville. This same employee also contacted the Box Elder County Sheriff's Office to inform where and when the dog was found. Cynthia said that the people that found the dog had a hard time catching her. Cynthia then contacted the Box Elder County Sheriff's Office and was notified that Box Elder County Search and Rescue would be out looking for Matt. The following day, family and friends also assisted in this search. For two days, an extensive search was initiated by Box Elder Search and Rescue, Shoshone Bannock Tribe's Fish and Game Department, 50 family members and friends from Fort Hall, searching an eight-mile radius from the I-84 exit ramps where the pickup truck and his dog were found. Utah search and rescued, and their dogs were utilized. Also, searchers on horseback in the Utah Sheriff's Office launched a drone to assist in a search. On March 29th, Matt's truck was retrieved at his residence by Fort Hall police detectives and stored at their facility until Box Elder County detectives in Brigham City were able to process the vehicle for the investigation. Cell phone data, fingerprints, and DNA results were pending. Box Elder County Sheriff Kevin Potter and his detectives have been following up on numerous reported sightings of Matthew, including going to Salt Lake City and showing his photograph around in the areas where homeless people are known to congregate. Family members have also traveled to Salt Lake and Boise areas. Following reported sightings, the outcome of those sightings have resulted in mistaken identity. Another detective from the Bucks Elder County Sheriff's Department may have been seen in the Salt Lake City area as security guards indicated they might have seen him. 
A director of public safety for the Confederated Tribes of Colville Reservation had hosted a discussion around bridging the relationship between agencies and tribes. As many call for cross deputization of tribal and local police officers, so cases are examined sooner. It has been a major issue and of extreme importance to Shoshone Bannock tribal members. Cynthia has mentioned that there has been some jurisdiction issues since her son's disappearance. Even after these three years, Matt's parents are unsure where the investigation stands. His case has been passed through multiple detectives in both Fort Hall and Box Elder County. When it comes to MMIMB, which is an acronym for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Men and Boys, thousands of American Indian Alaska Natives, men and boys who are missing or murdered in the U.S., capture little media attention in the shadow of a greater campaign seeking justice for missing and murdered Indigenous women. The acronym is MMIW. I have mentioned this a couple times in previous episodes, and this is imperative campaign as well. However, our men and boys are missing and murdered in a way higher in numbers. Men are murdered and missing more than women. In the media, it has been a case of gender stereotypes. Women are perceived as more vulnerable versus men being able to take care of themselves. In some instances, because men commit most of the violence crimes against women, Families and law enforcement fail to recognize that men, too, are vulnerable. However, law enforcement will write it off as, they'll be back. Or a medical examiner may note the cause of death as an overdose or alcohol-related for both men and women, even goes to the lengths of misclassifying their race as white, especially if the victim is of mixed race. Yet several federal agencies collect homicide data, but reporting is mostly voluntary. Federal law requires police to report all missing juveniles to the FBI's National Crime Information Center, but not adults. Identified in 2019, only 47 tribes have access to NCIC. Matt's disappearance opened Jimmy Broncho's eyes to how big the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous people really are. The Bureau of Indian Affairs, BIA, estimates that there are about 4,200 cases that have gone unsolved. Native communities experience disproportionately high rates of assault, abduction, and murder. Rates that advocates say that are tied to a quote-unquote legacy of generations of government policies of forced removal land seizures, and violent inflicted on Native peoples, end quote, based on BIA's website. Thankfully, enough voices have been heard and have motioned to create a number of bills that have been introduced that would address these issues. The Savannah's Act would improve tribal access to national databases and require the Department of Justice to develop a national guidelines for handling missing and murdered Native Americans, and reports statistics annually to the Congress. The Bridging Agency Data Gaps and Ensuring Safety, also called badges, for Native Communities Act, would improve sharing of law enforcement agency data and boost officer recruitment and retention. The Not Invisible Act of 2019, which will require the Department of Justice to allocate more resources towards missing and murder Native Americans based on input from local, tribal, and federal leaders, and also introducing amendments to the Violence Against Women's Act. When Matt first disappeared, a local Fort Hall Missing and Murdered Indigenous Peoples, MMIP, group called Carrying the Message reached out to Cynthia. The group helped organize a prayer walk and run for Matt in June of 2019, 
The group have helped organize a prayer walk and run. In 2020, which was the second anniversary of Matt's disappearance, the group held a balloon release to bring awareness to the MMIP crisis. Just recently this year, Cynthia and Jimmy attended a vigil and prayer walk for Matt on March 18th and 19th in Fort Hall. And while Cynthia and Jimmy continue raising awareness for their son Matt, they feel that the law enforcement has stopped prioritizing their son's case. Matt's parents even approached the Shoshone Bannock Tribes Tribal Council to encourage them to continue working on the case. And they have been given many excuses as being short staffed or they couldn't talk about it at the moment. Constant stonewalling is even being done on the reservation side. Even when the Fort Hall criminal investigator wasn't able to speak with Native News Online for an interview due to tribal restrictions regarding talking to the press about Matt's disappearance. Cynthia and Jimmy still hope they will find their son. Matt's father is constantly praying in hopes that maybe they'll find an answer to where he is. Matthew J. Broncho is considered an endangered missing person. If anyone has any information on Matthew Broncho's whereabouts, contact Sheriff Kevin Potter or Detective Scott Lewis at the Box Elder County Sheriff's Office at 435-734-3881 or the Fort Hall Police Department at 208-478-4000. I will have all the information and resources in the show notes. Cynthia's advice to others with missing loved ones is, don't wait. When somebody disappears or you're missing somebody, you need to get that information out as soon as possible, she states. Get it out to the police department, get it out to the media, and start searching. Thank you for listening to Hands Off My Podcast. If you are enjoying the podcast, and you'd like to support the mission, I do have a Patreon membership that will help the cause and bring more detail on cases and stories from the people of color community. If you yourself has a lost loved one or a story suggestion, please don't hesitate to contact me at email. Hands off my podcast at gmail.com. And if you are only able to support in another way, please give this podcast a five star rating on Apple or Spotify, and continue to listen to upcoming episodes every Thursday, wherever you listen to your podcasts. Dios te bendiga.